All Saints Church Beverly Hills offers a premier performance of a Christmas triptych, a portion of the book, The Magnificent Defeat, by Frederick Beekner. You will hear the voices of Edward G. Robinson as the shepherd, Frederick Warlock as the innkeeper, and Raymond Massey as a wise man. The All Saints Choir is under the direction of Owen Brady. region there were shepherds out in the field keeping watch over their flock by night. It was cold that night, and I was terribly hungry. I'd finished all the bread I had in my sack, but my gut still ached for more. And then I noticed my friend, a shepherd like me, about to throw away a crust he didn't want. So I said, throw the crust to me, friend. And he did throw it to me. But it landed between us in the mud where the sheep had mucked it up. But I grabbed it anyway, and I stuffed it, mud and all, into my mouth. And as I was eating it, I suddenly saw myself. It was as if I was not only a man eating, but a man watching the man eating. And I thought, this is who I am. I'm a man who eats muddy bread. And I thought... The bread is very good. And I thought, and the mud is very good, too. So I opened my muddy man's mouth full of bread, and I yelled to my friends, By God, it's good, brothers! And they thought I was a terrible fool. But they saw what I meant. We saw everything that night. Everything. Everything. I wonder if I can make you understand. Have you ever had this happen to you? You've been working hard all day. You're dog tired, so you call it quits for a while. You slum down under a tree or uh, against a rock or something and just sit there in a the daze for, oh, I don't know, half an hour, maybe a million years. I don't know. And all this time, your eyes are wide open, looking straight ahead, someplace, but they're so tired and glassy, they don't see a thing, nothing. You could be dead for all you notice. And then, little by little, you begin to come too. And then your eyes begin to come to. And all of a sudden, you find out you've been looking at something the whole time, except it's only now that you really see it. One of the ewe lambs, maybe, with his foot caught under a rock, or the moon scorching a hole through the clouds. 
It was there all the time, and you were looking at it all the time, but you didn't see it till just now. Well, that's how it was this night anyway. Like finally coming to, not things coming out of nowhere that have never been there before, but things just coming into focus that had been there always. And such things. The air wasn't just emptiness anymore. It was alive. Brightness everywhere, dipping and wheeling like a flock of birds. And what you always thought was silence... Stop being silent and turn into the beating of wings, thousands and thousands of them. Only not just wings, but voices, high, wild, like, like trumpets. Well, the words I could never remember later, but something like what I'd yelled with my mouth full of, full of bread. By God, it's good, brothers. The crust, the mud, everything. Everything. Oh, well. <laughs> if you think we were out of our minds, you're, you're right, of course. And you know, it was just like being out of jail. I can see us still. We all tore off across that muddy field like drunks at a fair, and drunk we were, crazy drunk, splashing through a sea of wings and moonlight and the silvery wool of the sheep. Was it night? Was it day? Did our feet touch the ground? Shh! Shh! You'll, you'll wake my guests, said the innkeeper. He was coming in the other direction with his arms full of wood, and when we got to the shed out back, one of the three foreigners who were there held a finger to his lips. At the eye of the storm, you know, there's no wind, nothing moves, nothing breathes. Even silence keeps silent. So hush now. Hush. There he is. You see him? You see him? By almighty God, brothers, open your eyes. Listen. She gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no place for them in the inn. the one who told them there was no room. That was a long, long time ago, and a long, long way away. But the memories of men are also long, and nobody has forgotten anything about my own sad, queer part in it all. Unless maybe they have forgotten the truth about it. But you can never blame people for forgetting the truth because it is, after all, such a subtle and evasive commodity. In fact, all that distinguishes a truth from a lie may finally be no more than just the flutter of an eyelid or the tone of a voice. If I were to say, I believe, that would be a lie. But if I were to say, I believe, 
that might be the truth. So I do not blame posterity for forgetting the subtleties and making me out to be the black villain of the piece, the heartless one who said, no room, no room. I'll even grant you that a kind of villainy may be part of the truth. But if you want to speak the whole truth, then you will have to call me a villain with a catch in your voice, at least a tremor, a hesitation maybe, with even the glitter of almost a tear in your eye, because nothing is entirely black, you know, not even the human heart. I speak to you as men of the world, not as idealists, but as realists. Do you know what it's like to run an inn, to run a business, a family, to run anything in this world for that matter, even your own life? It's like being lost in a forest of a million trees, and each tree is a thing to be done. Is there fresh linen on all the beds? Did the children put on their coats before they went out? Has the letter been written, the book read? Is there money enough left in the bank? Today, we have food in our bellies and clothes on our backs. But what can we do to make sure that we will have them still tomorrow? A million trees. A million things. Until finally, we have eyes for nothing else. And whatever we see turns into a thing. The sparrow lying in the dust at your feet. Just a thing to be kicked out of the way. Not the mystery of death. The calling of children outside your window. Just a distraction, an irrelevance. Not life, not the wildest miracle of them all. That whispering in the air that comes sudden and soft from nowhere. Only the wind, the wind. Of course, I remember very well the evening they arrived. I was working on my accounts and looked up just in time to see the woman coming through the door. She walked in that slow, heavy-footed way that women have in the last months, as though they're walking in a dream or at the bottom of the sea. Her husband stood a little behind her, a tongue-tied, a helpless kind of man, I thought, I cannot remember either of them saying anything, although I suppose some words must have passed, but at least it was mostly silence, the clumsy silence of the poor. You know what I mean. It was clear enough what they wanted. The stars had come out. I remember the stars perfectly, though I don't know why I should, sitting inside as I was and my wife's cat jumped up onto the table where I was sitting. I had not uh, stood up, of course. It was mainly just silence. Then it happened much in the way that you have heard. I did not lie about there being no room left. There really was none. Though perhaps if there had been a room, I, I might have lied. As much for their sakes as for the sake of the inn. Their kind would have felt more at home in a stable, that's all. And, and I do not mean that unkindly either, God knows. Later that night, when the baby came, I was not there. I was lost in the forest somewhere, the unenchanted forest of a million trees. Fifteen steps to the cellar and watch out for your head going down. Firewood to the left. If the fire goes out, the heart freezes. Only the wind. The wind. I speak to you as men of the world, so when the baby came, I was not around, and I saw none of it. As for what I heard, just at that moment itself of birth, when nobody turns into somebody, I do not rightfully know what I heard. But this 
I do know. My own true love. All your life long, you wait for your own true love to come. We all of us do. Our destiny, our joy, our heart's desire. So, how am I to say it, gentlemen? When he came, I missed him. Pray for me, brothers and sisters. Pray for the innkeeper. Pray for me and for us all. My own true love. Now when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, Behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and have come to worship him. Beware of beautiful strangers, and on Friday avoid travel by water. The sun is moving into the house of Venus, so affairs of the heart will prosper. We said this to Herod, or something along those lines, and of course it meant next to nothing. To have told him anything of real value, we would have had to spend weeks of study, months, calculating the conjunction of the planets at the precise moment of his birth, and at the births of his parents and their parents back to the fourth generation. But Herod knew nothing of this, and he jumped at the nonsense we threw him like a hungry dog and thanked us for it. A lost man, you see, even though he was a king. Neither really a Jew nor really a Roman. He was at home nowhere, and he believed in nothing. Neither Olympian Zeus nor the Holy One of Israel, who cannot be named. So he was ready to jump at anything, and he swallowed our little jingle whole. But it could hardly have been more obvious that jingles were the least of what he wanted from us. Go find me the child, the king told us, and as he spoke, his fingers trembled so that the emeralds rattled together like teeth. Because I want to come and worship him, he said. And when he said that, his hands were still as death death. I ask you, does a man need the stars to tell him that no king has ever yet bowed down to another king? He took us for children, that sly, lost old fox. And so it was like children that we answered him. Yes, of course, we said, and went our way. His hands fluttered to his throat like moths. Why did we travel so far to be there when it happened? Why was it not enough just to know the secret without having to be there ourselves to behold it? To this, not even the stars had an answer. The stars said simply that he would be born. It was another voice altogether that said to go, a voice as deep within ourselves as the stars are deep within the sky. But why did we go? I could not tell you now, and I could not have told you then, not even as we were in the very process of going. Not that we had no motive, but that we had so many. Curiosity, I suppose. To be wise is to be eternally curious, and we were very wise. We wanted to see for ourselves this one before whom even the stars are said to bow down. 
to see perhaps if it was really true, because even the wise have their doubts. And longing, longing. Why will a man who is dying of thirst crawl miles across sands as hot as fire at simply the possibility of water? But if we long to receive, we longed also to give. Why will a man labor and struggle all the days of his life so that in the end he has something to give the one he loves? So finally we got to the place where the star pointed us. It was at night, very cold. The innkeeper showed us the way that we did not need to be shown. A harebrained, busy man. The odor of the hay was sweet and the cattle's breath came out in little puffs of mist. The man and the woman, between them the king. We did not stay long. Only a few minutes as the clock goes, 10,000, thousand years. We set our foolish gifts down on the straw and left. I will tell you two terrible things. What we saw on the face of the newborn child was his death. A fool could have seen it as well. It sat on his head like a crown or a bat, this death that he would die. And we saw, as sure as the earth beneath our feet, that to stay with him would be to share that death. And that is why we left, giving only our gifts, withholding the rest. And now, brothers, I will ask you a terrible question, and God knows I ask it also of myself. Is the truth beyond all truths, beyond the stars, just this, that to live without him is the real death, that to die with him is the only life.